we're going to get started with the Q&A now. So first question, uh, Mr. Stevens, is what have you been doing in quarantine these past few months? Ah, good question. Um, I, I've actually enjoyed it, uh, believe it or not, um, because um, so I, I've been living, I, I live here in Atherton, you know, in the Menlo Park area, uh, a few minutes from Stanford campus. And then um, I also have a second home down on the coast in Santa Cruz. So I've kind of been toggling between those two places. And, um, you know, the, the one thing about this quarantine is um, I think I've in some ways become much more efficient. I can do meetings like this over Zoom and I don't have to commute to go to a board meeting or uh, down to Los Angeles for a USC uh, event or a board meeting. Um, the pace of life has slowed down. I've been able to spend more time with my kids and my wife because everybody's home. Um, I've been able to uh, clean out, you know, just get projects done around the house that you never, you always have on your list of things to do, but you never get them done. Um, so in, in a weird way, um, I've enjoyed it. I, you know, I feel sorry for, I have three kids and all three are graduating um, this spring. I have my daughter who's graduating high school and my two sons are graduating college. So I kind of feel sorry for them uh, because they're not going to have the experience that, um, in, in, that you have in a normal year. But um, so I, I've been, um, you know, uh, getting a lot of reading done. Ke again, catching up on movies that you always, you know, tell yourself you want to see. And um, so I'm glad, you know, we're, we're uh, gradually phasing out of the uh, shelter in place here in the Bay Area. Um, but um, traffic is a lot better in the Bay Area. <laughs> uh, so, I, I mean, there's, you know, you, there's silver linings and in, in, in these kinds of things and these kinds of crises. So, so that's kind of what I've been up to. That's great to hear. Our next question comes from Justin. So I'm going to unmute you, Justin. Uh, Justin, are you? Oh. All right, cool. Yeah. Uh, so how did you end up becoming a venture capitalist, Mr. Stevens? Um, sort of by combination of, uh, you know, luck and uh, uh, experience and, um, you know, being at the right place at the right time. So I just, you know, my background, so, you know, I, you know, I grew up in LA, went to, um, uh, Culver City High School, then went to USC um, and pursued an electrical engineering degree. Although I started out as a chemical engineer and I switched majors in my freshman year. Um, and then graduated from USC um, in 1981 with a bachelor's in electrical engineering and a bachelor's in economics. It was a dual degree program. And then um, I'd worked at Hughes Aircraft during school as a as an engineer, you know, writing code and debugging hardware and stuff. And then um, uh, decided I didn't want to work in a big aerospace company for my career. So I left I left Hughes um, uh, right after I graduated from SC. And I was pretty young. I, I started college when I was seventeen. Um, and so I joined Intel. I was barely twenty two. I just turned twenty two, and I was at Intel for about five and a half years. Um, most of the time in Los Angeles in um, field operations and application engineering. Um, and then I went to business school at Harvard um, in Boston and was there two years. And that's when I kind of started learning about, you know, what a, a VC does or is. Um, and it, um, you know, so I, it wasn't like I grew up, you know, a lot of kids grew up and you want to be a doctor, you want to be a scientist, you want to be a lawyer, you want to be an athlete. I, you know, back in 1989, um, very few people know, knew what a VC did. <laughs> I mean, if you were in Silicon Valley, maybe you knew some VCs or your company had been funded by a VC or something, but um, it, it was a career that really was obscure at the time. And um, so when I was at business school, I, uh, uh, I kind of researched it and, and I thought it was a good blend of my technical background uh, it was a good use of my background in Intel in terms of technical sales and marketing. And, you know, finally the MBA, you know, in terms of understanding cash flows and finance. So I thought the VC career was a good use of all of those three things. And so I, um, you know, this is before the days of the internet and email. I 
mailed my resume. I, I went to the library at Harvard and I figured out all of the, you know, top West Coast VC firms. And I sent letters with the cover letter and my resume, you know, like the good old fashioned way. And um, Sequoia that, that year was looking for a, an associate who had a semiconductor background and had some sales and marketing background. So I kind of, you know, fit the spec perfectly. Um, and I joined Sequoia, right, literally a month after I graduated from business school. So, um, so you know, I had the right background. I had worked hard up until then. But then, you know, there, there's an element of luck. And it just so happened Sequoia was looking for somebody with my kind of background that particular year. So, um, so yeah, so I joined Sequoia in the summer of 1989. So, um, <clears throat> so that's, how, that's, how I, that's how I did it. So. All right, uh, so you just talked a lot about your current venture capital. Um, a question that someone submitted, but unfortunately isn't here, uh, was about what skills you learned before you became a VC um, in between you know, USC, Intel, and then basically what skills did you acquire before you became a VC? Well, you know, I, I think to be a, a, a good uh, VC, especially an early stage VC where you're investing in you know, pretty raw startups, um, you know, you have to have, I think, some basic baseline technical background. I mean, if you're going to invest in semiconductor chips, you, and you better know kind of what the lingo is in, of that industry. Or if you're going to invest in a biotechnology company, you better have some understanding of RNA and DNA and things like that, right? So I think a, a good technical underpinning is important. Um, I think you need to understand... Um, uh, product market fit, you know, you, you can develop the best product in the world, the best piece of software, the best chip, the best whatever, best drug. But if you don't understand how to take it to market, how to sell it, um, use different channels of distribution, then it's, your, the company's not going to be successful. So you need to have an appreciation of the sales and marketing world. And then I think you need to have an appreciation of, you know, being able to, um, figure out uh, margins and cash flows and you know all the financial kinds of, of things that make a company successful. So I think those sort of three areas are pretty critical to have a background in to be a good VC. All right, so another question that someone submitted, but again, uh, wasn't able to make it today was, uh, what are some examples of the adversity you've had to overcome to reach success? Um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I'm actually adopted. So my, I, I was adopted a, a, as an infant. And so um, I never knew my natural parents. And, and the par my parents who adopted me are great. They loved me. But they were certainly sort of lower middle class, maybe middle class. My, my dad was a, um, a, a never, he went to a little bit of college. My mom never went to college. Um, and so, um, you know, I, uh, I always worked hard to sort of prove, prove to myself and prove to others that I could, you know, do well. Um, and um, again, I, growing up, I didn't, we didn't have a lot of money. And so even to spend, you know, back in those days, 50 bucks or whatever on an AP test was, was a challenge for my family. Um, and uh, I, uh, you know, I applied to four colleges, you know, back in those days, people only applied to a lot fewer colleges. And, um, and I, and then I chose SC over, over UCLA and Berkeley, um, and Stanford primarily, you know, cause I was able to sort of cobble together enough financial aid and Cal grants and savings for my times I was working part-time. And so, cause my parents couldn't afford a university like USC at, at the time. So, um, so I, you know, I had adversity along the way. I mean, it's, um, you know, um, um, you know, it, it, you have to sort of persevere to, to be successful in your career. And, um, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate in the sense that, um, you know, I have health and, um, again, <clears throat> a loving family and everything, but it, you know, it was, it was not a, not a straight up path to success or, you know, there's always little jags along the way so yeah thanks for sharing that um our next question comes from james i'm gonna meet you james 
Hello, Mr. Stevens. Um, great to be talking with you. Just really quickly, I'm the, I'm the student from Chicago and I live about 15 minutes from Northwestern. Beautiful school. I'm sure your daughter's going to love it. Um, as far as my question goes, um, I know that you've invested in companies in the like of Yahoo, YouTube, Google, and many other huge companies like that. What would you say are, was, was your best investment and worst investment and what lessons have you learned along the way? That's a great question. Um, so, um, so when at Sequoia, uh, you know, we're, we're organized as a partnership. So I, I had about six or seven partners, um, and you know, we shared the deal. So like I didn't personally go on the board of Yahoo and Google. One of my partners did, but I was involved with decision-making and the due diligence. I ended up going on the board of NVIDIA, even though, you know, my partners helped me make that decision. So, um, um, so, so I, you know, I, I, I would say that all these companies are Sequoia's investments, not an individual partner, myself or a Doug Leone or some of my other former partners. Um, cause the VC business is a, it is a team sport. Um, and, um, uh, I, I think my favorite investment, best investment is NVIDIA. I, it was a company that, uh, we uh, did the series A, the, the first financing, uh, 1993, um, uh, Jensen Wong is the, the one of the co-founders and CEO, and he's still CEO today. You know, twenty whatever that many, twenty-seven years later. Um, and so I've uh, I'm still on that board today, uh, rep not representing Sequoia, but just representing uh, myself basically. Um, so that's probably my best investment because Nvidia is. You guys probably you guys know the company. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have Nvidia cards and your uh, your laptops and desktops. Um, and, you know, they're really, and they're really leading the, they are the AI company of today and tomorrow, I think. Uh, worst investment? Um, a lot of them. Uh, you, you know, and the, you, you learn more from your unsuccessful investments than your successful ones. Um, you know, my first investment that I recommended uh, at Sequoia, um, you know, I was, had only been there a couple of years and it was a chip company and it tanked. Um, you know, we, we lost all of our money. Um, but I learned a ton, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, you, you always learn from your failure. You should learn from your failures. And so, um, and at Sequoia, you know, we would document, we, we would go back to our due diligence and usually why a company fails is in the due diligence that you do before they make, make the investment. You know, when you reread, you go, ah, that happened or that happened. So, um, so, you know, doing postmortems on unsuccessful investments, um, is a great way to learn. So. All right, thank you. Our uh, next question comes from uh, Evan Thomas. Uh, Evan. Um, uh, what percentage of a venture capitalist job is dedicated to operating or advising and how much is spent on investing and researching? Good question. Um, so the way you think about the venture capital today, I, I put it in, in sort of three buckets. Um, one bucket is, um, uh, looking for investment opportunities and um, negotiating with the founders, doing due diligence in terms of, you know, doing reference checks. That's probably 40% of your time, 45%. Uh, the other big bucket is um, time you spent after you make the investment. So usually you'll go on the board of directors uh, and you'll have monthly board meetings and you'll work with the founders and the management team to help build the company. And that could be helping them with product strategy, making introductions to potential customers, um, helping them hire uh, key executives, help them hire salespeople. So that's probably another 40 to 45% of your time. And then there's about 10% of your time, which I would call administrative stuff. And that's, um, uh, interfacing with the limited partners. The limited partners are the institutions who provide VCs with funding. So at Sequoia, our, um, the institutions that provide us with, with funding were people like Stanford and Notre Dame and USC and the Ford Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation. Um, so spending time with them, um, you know, because they're our customers in a sense. Uh, and then just general administrative stuff, right? You know, hiring the office staff and um, doing reviews and, um, 
offsites and things like that. So those are sort of the three buckets that how a VC spends their time. And it's not an eight to five job, believe me. It's you're kind of, you know, 24 seven, you know, when I was a general partner at Sequoia, it was a 60 hour week. If you include all the reading you do over the weekend and stuff like that, it is not, you know, it's kind of, it's become a glamorized career in a sense. Everybody wants to be a VC, uh, but it's, it's, it's hard work. Um, and uh, I, I think VCs, I think the, the, the sweet spot is like 30 years old to 50 years old. Because I think if you're younger than 30, you kind of really don't know what you don't know yet in a sense. And if you're over 50 or 60, you, you kind of start losing touch with technology trends. And, you know, most great companies are started by people in their 30s and 40s, and you just kind of lose touch with that generation. So, um, so it's, um, it's a, it, you know, it's a great career, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's hard work. So. All right, our next question comes from Anish. I'm going to mute you, Anish. Anish, you there? Oh. Okay, um, if he's not, you know. All right, our next question actually comes from Sean. Uh, he's next on the list. So, Sean, you want to ask your question? Hi, Mr. Stevens. Thanks for talking to us. My question is what are the benefits and drawbacks of investing with a team? versus like investing on your own, like most regular investors? Well, um, the, the advantage of, of, of work, investing uh, in, in a team structure like a VC firm is that, um, you know, you have multiple points of view and multiple people to help you with due diligence. And so, you know, at Sequoia, we, you know, um, I was kind of the go-to guy on, on chip deals, semiconductors, because, you know, my background at Intel, I had other partners, you know, they had their backgrounds were in software or media or uh, networking hardware. And so they would be the go-to person, but we always had, we, we always, um, um, we were contemplating a new investment. We always worked in teams and we would, you know, we would get like a list of, you know, 10 reference checks from the company and we would divvy them up. I would do two or three when my partners, would, you know, other partners would do two or three. And so um, I, I think there's strength when a, when a team, a small team is making a decision than just an individual. Because um, investing as an individual, you know, you sort of, um, you don't have somebody to bounce ideas off of or be able to say, hey, what have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? So I think um, investing, as a, in a team approach is just much better because um, you got multiple eyes and ears and brains, you know, evaluating the opportunity. So, um, and I think investing on your own is kind of lonely. <laughs> um, now you have the advantage of investing on your own. You could move quicker uh, and you only have yourself to blame if the investment fails. So I guess those are some advantages, um, but um, I think the team approach is much, much more fun and much more effective. So our next question comes from Rajan. Um, so Rajan, want to ask you a question? Uh, let me unmute you first. Uh, first of all, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. I was curious to know how do VCs necessarily compete with each other? And first of all, how competitive is the industry for entry level venture capitalists? And what do venture capitalists compete for? Well, so I, I uh, the term I, I've always used about the VC business, it's um, uh, I, I use the term co-opetition, uh, combination of cooperativeness and competition. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, going when I got into business, um, it was much smaller. The funds were smaller, and um, most of the deals were done with you know two or three VCs each putting in some capital to, 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 to uh, create a, a round of capital for the company. Um, nowadays, it's more common to see a single VC write a big check into a, into a, a, a company. Um, and so you're, on the one hand, you're cooperating with other VCs. A lot of times you're trading deals, you know, they'll invest in your deal and then you invest in one of their deals. 
So there is cooperation. Uh, a lot of times, if you look in you know, a lot of companies, there's multiple VCs that are on the board and that are investing in the same company. So you have to cooperate with the other um, VC board members. But uh, it's a very competitive business. I mean, you know, um, a lot of times, you know, there's five or six or more firms trying to get into a into a uh, investment opportunity, and um, and you really have to, uh, you know, everybody's money is green, right? It, that's not the issue. The issue is, you know, when a VC and a founder or founding team get together, I mean, it's like you're getting married for several years, right? And uh, you better make sure that that partner is somebody you want, you want to spend time with and be in business with. And, um, and so you, you have to take the time to really get to know the founders. They need to get to know you. Um, and um, uh, so it's very competitive from that point of view. Um, you know, you have to be part salesperson and part psychologist. Um, um, and, and it's very competitive to get into the best um, into, into the best deals, if you will. Uh, it, was, it was true 30 years ago and it's even, you know, even more true today, so. All right, thank you. Our uh, next question comes from Jack Stafford. Jake, wanna ask your question? Um, uh, thank you for coming on here. I really appreciate it. Uh, so you've invested a lot into the Golden State Warriors. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, uh, what made you choose the Warriors? Is it just your location or was it anything else besides that? Because I know you're uh, native to the Bay Area. Um, well, I, well I'm at, I, I grew up in Los Angeles, so I grew up. Like, I mean, you live in the Bay Area currently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I actually grew up as a Lakers fan uh, back in the 70s and 80s. Um, and um, I, I played high school basketball. I played intramural basketball in college. I, I played basketball. I still play a little basketball, uh, but not as much as I did in my 20s and 30s. Um, so I've always been a basketball fan, a uh, huge fan. And um, um, so about, so well, going back to so, uh, 10 years ago, 2010, um, the Warriors changed hands, the previous owner, sold the company to Joe Lake up in uh, a, a group of investors he brought together. Um, I actually know Joe very well. I've known him for 25 years. He, he was a partner at Kleiner Perkins for many years on their healthcare side. Um, and I was at Sequoia at the time. So, you know, we got to know the Kleiner Perkins guys and they knew us. And I used to play basketball with Joe at a, a local health club here in the Valley. Um, and then uh, in 2000, so they bought the team in 2010. You know, the team was a mess. They cleaned it up anyway. Um, so 2013 is when I bought into the team. And one of the uh, investors who came in with Joe in 2010, he was decided he, he, bought, he bought the Sacramento Kings. And um, the NBA bylaws say, you know, you, you can't be an owner in two, two different teams, right, for conflict reasons. So he had, he was forced to sell his stake in the Warriors and it was, you know, fairly sizable stake. And so I, that's, so that's when I bought in, I bought his stake um, and, and joined the executive board. So I've been an investor now seven years. So, um, and so I, yeah, it happens that the Warriors are the local team and the rest of the ownership group, I actually, there's a lot of VCs and, um, just people from the tech industry that I've known for years. So it was pretty easy uh, to, in, you know, insert into myself, into that group. So, um, so that's how I, that's how it came about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Our next uh, question comes from Adi. I'm going to unmute you. Uh, yeah. So uh, is there a certain process you use to decide to invest in a company? Yeah. Um, uh, the way I look at a company, you know, you, you kind of put it into four or maybe five buckets, right? Um, you want to look at the market opportunity. Uh, you want to look at product. Um, it is the product truly proprietary, unique, um, uh, uh, 
you evaluate the team, you know, are the, is the team super high quality? You know, are they super smart, work super hard? Um, and then the fourth thing is, is the looking at the financial aspects of the company, you know, how much capital are they ultimately going to need um, to get profitable? How long is it going to take? Um, you know, um, can, is, is this a company that's going to be a public company someday, or is it likely an acquisition for somebody like Amazon or Google or somebody like that? So those are the four areas that we kind of group. Those are the four areas of risk, and that, and that's kind of how you base your analysis, right? Um, I, and if you're a biotech company or a pharmaceutical company or a sort of a healthcare company, there's a fifth area of risk or areas that we evaluate, and that's regulatory risk, right? You have to get your drug approved by the FDA and things like that. So <clears throat> four or five sort of buckets of risk, areas of analysis. Um, and at Sequoia, we had a philosophy that the most important of those five was the market. The, the, you know, how big is the market? How fast is it growing? How ferocious is, is the competition? Um, is it a global market or is it, or is it only a U.S. market? Um, and so we really focused on size of market and market dynamics. And, you know, when you're a startup, you can't, um, you have to sort of accept the landscape around you the way it is. As a startup, you don't have infinite amounts of cash or resources to try to conquer a new market opportunity. As a startup, your advantages are what I call the three S's, uh, speed, stealth, and surprise, All right? Speed to market. Uh, stealth, you, you, when you're developing a really cool new product, you got to keep it quiet so that the big guys don't, you know, get wind of it. And surprise, when you, when you launch your product, you want to surprise the world, right? You want to surprise, um, you know, I mean, look, look what Apple's done over the last 25 years, right? I mean, they su surprised the world a lot with, when they announce a new product. So, um, so that's kind of how, I, that's how I frame an investment opportunity. Um, but I, I, my partners at Sequoia, we always kind of focus, the, the big one is market, um, market opportunity. Now, I mean, you want to invest in a, you know, A-grade market, A-grade technology, A-grade people, and be able to raise as little, little money as possible. But in most cases, you don't have all those as A's. You know, a lot of times you have a B-plus team and, you know, B-plus technology. But if you have an A market, that's that is huge, um, you can be very successful, even though you may not have an, you know, the best product in the, in the marketplace. So. All right, our next question is gonna come from Michael Payne. Uh, maybe unmute Michael. All right, cool. Sure, hi, Mr. Stevens. Thank you so much for doing this. And my question is, how has the landscape of business in Silicon Valley either evolved or shifted over the course of your career? Good question. Um, yeah, so I, um, as I said earlier, I joined Intel in 1982. Um, and, um, you know, the Valley at that point um, still had all, most of the Valley was still Apple or, you know, fruit orchards, right? Um, and uh, there was no traffic. Uh, and, um, you know, Silicon Valley had just become known in the popular press um, and the impact of the microprocessor was beginning to be felt, you know, the IBM, the original IBM desktop PC was introduced in 1981. Uh, Ethernet was invented in 1980. So um, um, the Valley was, um, you know, there were much more open spaces and, um, you know, you could buy a ranch house up in, up in the mountains for you know not very much money, um, so it, it's very different. Um, and, and each decade, um, you know, I've been through. Um, well, you know, when, when I came out of college, um, 1981, 82, there was, it was a horrible recession, um, and um, jobs are hard to find. And and then uh, we had another recession in like 91 time frame, And then, you know, we had in 2001, the tech bust and 2008, the, you know, uh, the credit crisis, and the great recession. So, you know, I've been through a lot of up and down cycles. Um, but 
but it, with every cycle, the valley comes out stronger and bigger and better. Um, I think the, the question is going forward is, um, th there's some systemic problems of emerging in Silicon Valley. The traffic is horrible. Uh, housing is non-existent. And if you can get it, it's very expensive. Um, there's a growing divide between have and have nots. Um, you know, there, there, there's a lot of structural problems. We have, you know, very, very high tax rates. Um, so <clears throat> it, it's going to be interesting to see when we come out of this COVID um, crisis, um, how the Valley, um, you know, responds. Um, you know, for example, uh, the work from home phenomena, my guess is that becomes a permanent fixture in, in the Valley and in, in the Bay Area. Um, where, you know, maybe 20% of the jobs are stay-at-home jobs. And that will help pollution, that will help traffic. Um, so I, um, I think the Valley is, you know, it's a unique place in the world. I mean, there's many other uh, tech hubs around the world that have tried to copy or replicate Silicon Valley, and it hasn't really been done anywhere else. I mean, you know, there are pockets like Austin and Boston and, um, Bangalore and India and obviously places in China. Um, but it's, it's still a pretty unique place um, for innovation and, and um, you know, it's been that way forever, so. All right, our uh, next question comes from Francois. Uh, can I meet you? Thank you for coming on. Uh, obviously, your investment in the Warriors has been a very successful one. My question is, what are the indicators in sports investment that suggest that your risk will be compensated? Um, yeah, so, um, you know, when I, when I did my due diligence back in 2013, I looked up and I found out that the average NBA franchise had appreciated in value 15% a year going back to the mid eighties. So, you know, 15% compounded every year. And why is that? Well, it turns out, um, you know, a sports team has multiple revenue streams, right? So you have TV rights, which are negotiated, they are multi-year TV rights that we negotiate with the networks, you know, with ABC or, you know, um, Fox or whoever it is. So you have a constant TV stream of revenues that increases every year, gets stepped up. You have gate receipts, ticket sales. Um, you have local TV uh, uh, contracts. So like in the Bay Area, we have you know Comcast Bay Area and they broadcast Warriors games. And so we get, um, you have uh, revenues coming from that. And then you have it, all the ancillary stuff, you know, t-shirts and food and beverage and parking and so forth. So, um, so you have multiple revenue streams and, um, you know, if you do a good job of marketing the team and, the, and if a team wins, <laughs> that always helps. Um, if you're in a big metro area like the Bay Area, that helps. Um, so, you know, and, and you've got to have good leadership and good management. Uh, you've got to have good, like I said, good marketing people. You've got to have a, a good, and the way the Warriors are organized, we have a sort of two sides of the house. We have basketball operations and we've got business operations. So, you know, ticket sales and uh, arena management, and all that comes under the business, our business, our president. And then we have another person who handles basketball operations. So the head coach, the scouting teams, all those folks report into him. So, um, it, you know, it's like, a, it, it's a bit, it's a, it's like a company, you know, I, I think of the Warriors, the way to think about it is it's a private company um, that's a combination of a real estate investment and a media investment is the way to think about it. Um, and, um, you know, many of the teams, not just in basketball, but across all the sports, you know, are very profitable. Uh, there's some teams, smaller market teams that, you know, don't make much money or in a lot of cases lose money. Um, but it's been a pretty consistent, um, growing business over the last, you know, three decades. So. All right, now we're gonna transition into talking kind of about the current pandemic. So our first question comes from Colleen Zen. Uh, okay, hi, 
Hi. So my question is, since Corona has like really impacted the market, what steps have you been like taking to like navigate it or like, have you found any new opportunities? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, my personal portfolio, uh, in, in my family office, we, so, so uh, let me back up uh, about half of my portfolio is still tech stocks. These are distributions I got from Sequoia. So I, you know, I still own a lot of Nvidia and Google and, uh, some Microsoft, some Amazon, um, you know, I, a lot of tech stocks. Um, my overall portfolio is greater in value than it was pre-COVID. <laughs> um, and uh, I think the, the tech stocks, you know, tech companies, especially ones that serve the stay-at-home market, have done very well. And so um, I, you know, like I said, I, I was surprised. Now, back in March, it was pretty scary because every every stock was to slip, everything was down 35%, right? And as you're going, oh crap, is this, you know, 2008 all over again or 2001 all over again. Um, the, the difference with, with, with COVID versus other recessions we've had is that, you know, the, this was a black swan event that nobody could see this coming. You know, 2008, it was a banking crisis. 2001, tech was overbought. Um, those were more structural or secular recessions, this was truly out of left field, right? And so I think the, the downturn of the last 10 weeks has been pretty sharp, but there's already signs that it's gonna be a sharp uptick. Um, and, and 2021 should be a good year you now for, for, for the US economy. Um, uh, the, the one area that I've, um, to answer your question, I, that I've put some money into in the last few weeks is um, credit is, uh, distress credit. A, a lot of companies in the energy space or in the hospitality space, um, their balance sheets are a wreck because they have no revenues coming in. And so if you can provide them with, uh, you know, uh, a credit, um, that can be a very lucrative, um, you know, over two, three years from now, that could be a really, a really lucrative area. So I, I've, I've invested in some uh, uh, distress credit funds and um, things like that. So, um, stayed away from, um, you know, I, I, <clears throat> I, I'm not going to dive back. In, I, I'm not going to dive in and go buy a bunch of airline or cruise stocks right now. Uh, but th there'll be a time for that. So. All right. Our next question comes from Cassie. Uh, can I meet Cassie? Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, so my question is about the future as well. Um, we all know the current global economy is facing a lot of uncertainty and our nation is having an election soon. Will the November election result affect your personal investment strategy? Uh, probably not. Um, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, you can't, I, I think it's easy for people to let politics uh, influence their investment decision making. Um, it's a factor, um, but, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't, it, it's not, uh, you know, it, it, you can't say, well, the Democrats win the presidency or win this, the Congress, you know, they're gonna want higher taxes and the market's gonna go down and the Republicans are gonna do this or that. So I, I you know, I, I, I factor into my thinking, but it's not, it's a small, it's a small part of my decision-making. I, I worry much more about the individual companies, products and markets and some of the stuff I was talking about earlier. Um, and, you know, if you look back in history, um, we've had some great economic runs with Democrats in the White House and we've had some great runs with Republicans. Um, and so I, 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 I refrain from sort of getting too wrapped up in, in you know, who's gonna win the election um, and affect my decision-making. Um, um, and I think, you know, when you when we have stalemate in Washington, i.e., Republican president and a Democratic 
controlled Congress or vice versa, in some ways the markets like that the best, right? Because <laughs> they know that you're not going to have radical shifts in policy. Um, so we'll be interested to see what happens in November. Um, um, you know, there, there's just there's too many unknown unknowns right now, uh, and trying to make a forecast on who wins the presidency and who wins control of the Senate and who wins control of the House is, I mean, who knows? It's it's kind of kind of crazy. So, all right, our next question comes from Christian. Going to unmute you. Hi there, Mr. Stevens. Thank you for your time uh, once again. Mm -hmm. um, so with everything going on right now, it's been a little hectic, um, I assume for you and for everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, but my question is, uh, since most high schoolers are going to be graduating within the next four to eight years, and since the virus has created yet another market crash, can we expect to enter a job market similar to 2008? And if so, how do we approach it? Yeah, I... Um... To going back to what I said earlier, I you know the, this this recession is much different than the, the the four that I've been through in my life in my adult life, right? Um, because this you know the, the American economy was humming as recently as ten weeks ago. I mean, you had all time low unemployment, especially for uh, people of color. Um, you had uh, all time low inflation. I mean, you had you, you had a really great economy going right um and 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 COVID happened so i i think um and i you know my uh sons and friends you know because like i said i had two sons graduating they all a lot of them they all had jobs especially if you're an engineering major or an or a business major you know you you, you probably had multiple job offers pre-covid so I, I think it's gonna be a tough job market for college grads in the next you know, year, I think. Um, but I think after that, it, I think things rebound quicker than they did in 08 and 01 is my forecast. Um, and, um, you know, for a lot of students, it's gonna be a great time to go to grad school, you know? I mean, you know, if you've got a bachelor's degree and you're thinking about getting a master's, well, maybe you go do that now instead of waiting, you know, a couple of years. Um, but I, I think the job market will be, it, it, it will rebound quicker than other recessions we've had, is my guess. Um, and I think for high school, how many of you are, how many people, are you all, are most of you seniors in high school or a lot? Quite yeah, so, yeah, I, so, um, you know, I'm on the board of trustees at USC and my wife's on the board of trustees at Santa Clara and I'm plugged into the, um, trustees at Northwestern and Harvard and Stanford and places like that. My guess is that um, colleges will be in session in person in the fall, um, not because it's probably the most sensible public health policy decision to make, but it, they have to do it because of economics. They cannot lose the tuition money. They cannot lose um, being, you know, they lose too much revenue being shut down. So um, I think you'll see in-person classes in the fall on college campuses. I think the, the, the experience will be different. Um, probably, may not have, probably won't have football games with you know, 80,000 people in the stands, but you'll have in-person classes, you'll have you know, events, but you know, events with no more than 100 people at any given time, those kinds of things. So, um, so it's, um, yeah, it's gonna be a tough, tough job market if you're coming out of college, I think, but you know. It's a, you know, if you're a good student and you work hard and, you know, you're aggressive, you know, you'll be able to get a job, so. Thank you. All right, our next question comes from Robert. Uh, hello, um, thanks for coming to talk today. Um, my question was uh, for high school seniors more specifically. Um, with the pandemic, uh, what do you recommend we do over the summer before college and like, since this summer is going to be a little bit different. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, my, my daughter's facing that question. Um, you know, it, I, I think job, there'll be fewer jobs available because again, uh, you know, organizations that hire 18 year olds for the summer, you know, tend to be, you know, amusement parks or, 
concert venues or thing, and those are gonna, not going to be open this summer. Um, I, you know, um, I would, I would, uh, you know, take the time and 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 uh, spend time with your family. Go on if you do a family vacation, because it might be the last one you ever do. Because once you're in college, you're with your friends, and you know you want to. Uh, and once you get out of college, you're probably starting a job or you're going off to grad school and so you probably you're not going to see your siblings or your parents as often so that's one that's one suggestion um and um but you know i, I would uh, you know maybe uh if you can't get a paid position um you know doing uh volunteer work in your community um helping people in your community get through the crisis um there's a lot and there's lots of ways to do that so um you know, just don't waste the summer and sit around and do nothing. Uh, but you know, dive into something and that you think is, you know, where you're going to learn. And if you get paid for a little bit, that's even better. Um, and because because well, you know, once you start college as a freshman, I mean, um, you know, it's it's it it's go it's fast. I mean, you're off and running. So you know, you take that ten week summer and you want to, you know, rest up put high school behind you, but you don't want to just not do nothing. I mean, you want to keep your mind active and keep your body active, and so. Okay, so our final question of this Q&A session is coming from Cameron. So Cameron, I'm gonna unmute you. Yeah. Uh, hey, Mr. Stevens, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, sure. And I have kind of like a different question. Um, if you were to go back to maybe your college or high school days, like what is one piece of knowledge uh, you would take uh, with you that you know right now um, in order to sort of um, succeed uh, business-wise? So, you know, what, what is one piece of important advice kind of that you would want to hold on to? Um, you know, I, I, what I counsel young people to think about is that, um, you know, as you're, as you're, pursuing your life journey and you're trying to figure out, you know, what to major in in college and you're, or if you're in college, you know, what am I going to do once I'm out of college in terms of a, a career, quote unquote. Um, my advice would be, my general advice would be uh, pick something that you really love. Don't pick a career or an activity because your parents tell you, because your parents did it uh, or because your peer group is doing it. Um, um, or it's a career where you make the most money, you know, up early in the early stage, do something that, uh, you're intellectually curious about that's fun. And at the end of the day, and this is not, this is just not something you think about when you're 18. I, I think about it, you know, I'm 60 years old now. You, when you get up in the morning, you want to get up in the morning, really being psyched about going to that class or going to that job um and if you're not then you're you're probably not in the right career or you're not in the right major right and so um you know do what's right for you in, in instinctually um and i think a lot of kids sort of do a major do a career because there's again either parents or family members are saying you know you should do this you should do that um, so I would resist that <laughs> and, 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 and keep an open mind. I mean, I changed majors in my freshman year. Most, most college students in these days change your, their majors or they add a minor or they add a second major. So be, op you know, be open to that. Um, you know, if you think, Hey, I really, really, really want to be a lawyer. Great. You, you, you take a political science or economics program in college and then you apply to law school. But think about, you know, are there some courses or things I can, activities I can do that um, give me a perspective beyond just the law, for example. Um, and I, so I think going forward, I think it's very true today, wasn't as true when I was your age, that you need to be multidisciplinary, you need to be flexible, uh, you need to understand <clears throat> different cultures around the world, um, and uh, the world is moving so fast now. The second derivative is positive. If you, for those of you who are physics majors, 
Um, you know, you have to, you have to have that sort of um, intellectual flexibility because the chances are, as we're all going to be living longer, you might change your career three or four times, five times between the time you're 22 and the time you're, you know, 60 or 70. So that would be my sort of overall advice that I give to either high school students or college students. Thank you. Okay, so we're coming up on our time limit. So Mr. Stevens, thanks so much for being here and for answering all our questions today. Thank you all for being here today. And once again, thanks Mr. Stevens for being here. All right, good luck everybody. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye.